Welcome back to our series on how God speaks to us. Today we'll be looking at how he speaks to us through other Christians. But first, let's recap some of the things we've been saying in this series so far. We have seen that there are many different ways in which God speaks to us, but primarily he speaks to us in the person of Jesus. He has finally spoken to us by his son. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 2 tells us very, very clearly. So he's spoken to us in Jesus. And then we've said that God speaks to us through the Bible. And we've looked at why we believe that God speaks to us through the Bible. Because the Bible tells us about Jesus. Because Jesus believed that God speaks to us through the Bible. The apostles in the early church believe that God speaks to us through the Bible. And the Bible itself shows us the way of salvation. And then we looked into how we should understand the Bible correctly. What part, part of the Bible are we reading? An important question to ask. What's the context of the passage we are reading? We talked about looking at the literary context, the historical, sociological context, and the immediate context. If you missed any of those talks, then I do suggest you go back and listen to them. They're very, very important in our understanding of how God does speak to us. And then we looked at different ways in which God speaks to us through the Bible. We saw that he teaches us what we should believe and how we should behave. He shows us what to expect by giving us examples from the lives of God's people. And he encourages us by giving us many wonderful promises. He directs us by bringing key verses to our attention. And that brought us to the general theme of how God speaks through other people. And last time we were looking at how God speaks to us through our parents. Today, as I have said, we'll be looking at how God speaks to us through other Christians. I suppose that if we were to ask most Christians who it is they expect God to use in speaking to them, their answer would almost certainly include preachers or pastors or even prophets. And we'll be dealing with these in later talks. But it's very important that we should realise that God often speaks through Christians who do not come into any of those categories. Of course, there are those who are especially gifted by God to speak for him. Ephesians 4.11, for example, mentions apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. But the New Testament also makes it clear that God expects all his people to speak for him. As I've pointed out elsewhere, there is a sense in which all God's people are prophets. There is a whole section of on that in my book, Bodybuilders, uh, chapter 3, which you might care to have a look at. The Holy Spirit can use anyone he chooses. For example, the great church at Antioch was first started by ordinary Christians spreading the word. In Acts 8, 1-4, we read that as a result of the persecution that followed the death of Stephen, the Christians were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. But they spread the word wherever they went. Acts 11, 19-21 tells us, Now those who'd been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks, Gentiles, also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So this church, which became the first great missionary sending church, the church in Antioch, was founded not by the apostles, who had all remained in Jerusalem, according to Acts 8 verse 2, but by ordinary Christians spreading the good news of the gospel. God can speak through any one of us. 
and he can speak to any one of us by whomever he chooses, as the following examples from my own experience demonstrate. In an earlier talk, I have already mentioned Laurie Dixon, whose testimony changed the course of my life. The year before I met Laurie, I was on holiday in the Lake District at a Baptist summer school where I made friends with a young man named Michael Stewart. Michael told me that the following year he was planning with a couple of Christian friends to take a car and visit several countries in Europe. He asked if I would be interested in joining them. Travelling abroad was far less common in those days than it is today, and I jumped at the opportunity. So, in 1958, I found myself in Switzerland with Michael and three new friends climbing a mountain. The long climb in the heat of the August sunshine had been long and tiring. We were unaccustomed to this kind of exercise and the cool water of the mountain stream was inviting to our aching feet. Graham, Michael and Daphne sat down to rest, paddling their feet in the water. But it was my first visit to Switzerland and somehow I felt that we were wasting an opportunity when there was so much to see. So, leaving the others to paddle, Laurie and I climbed higher following the path of the stream. But half an hour later, we'd had enough too. As we looked down at the others a few hundred feet below us, we realised that we'd come up the hard way. To our right, there was an easier way down. Gratefully, we turned to take it. When suddenly, as if from nowhere, a large rock came hurtling down the mountainside toward the stream, and I was directly in its path. As a fairly athletic 19-year-old, I should have been able to jump clear with relative ease, I suppose, but I was gripped with terror, unable to move. As a Christian, I might have thought of praying, but my mind refused to function. In a second, it would hit me. The end had surely come. But when the rock was only about a yard away, it struck a small protrusion in the ground, changed direction, and crashed into the stream below, missing me by inches. The danger was over as quickly as it had come. I heaved a sigh of inexpressible relief. Whew! That was lucky, I exclaimed. Lucky, David? said Laurie, who'd been watching from a few yards away. That wasn't luck. I believe God has a purpose for your life, and that rock couldn't have hit you. It was that simple statement of faith that started a process of inquiry, which was to lead to an experience which revolutionised my life. This man was moving in a dimension of Christianity that I knew little or nothing about. So I questioned Laurie to see if I could discover the basic difference. What had he got that I hadn't got? Although from different denominational backgrounds, I discovered that we had much in common. Doctrinally, our beliefs were almost identical. We believed the same Bible, preached the same gospel, and worshipped the same Saviour. We both knew what it meant to be a born-again Christian. We'd both been baptised as believers by immersion in water. Basically, we had very much in common. And yet this man had something which I didn't have, something indefinable but very real. And I asked him what it was. He started to talk about an experience he'd received after his conversion. Being baptised with the Holy Spirit, he called it. When the Holy Spirit had come and filled him to overflowing. He said that he'd spoken in tongues and told me I could read about it in the book of Acts. 
It was at this point, however, that my interest began to wane. I certainly wanted the experience to experience more of God in my life, but as for speaking in tongues, I frankly couldn't see the point of it. If being baptised with the Holy Spirit meant that I had to speak in tongues, I decided that I had better forget about it. And for a while, that's just what I did. On returning to England, I dismissed the subject from my mind and might have ignored it forever had it not been for the remarkable series of events which took place the following summer. Eileen, my fiancé and I were sitting in the youth meeting at church singing from a well-known chorus book when I happened to notice a list of books advertised on the back cover one of which was entitled The Full Blessing of Pentecost by Dr. Andrew Murray. Immediately, I concluded that this book must be dealing with the subject Laurie had been talking about last year in Switzerland, and I suggested that it might be good for us to get it. In a few days, Eileen received a reply from the advertisers saying that the book was no longer available. A little disappointed, I returned home from Eileen's house to my parents for lunch. As the meal wasn't quite ready, I went into the sitting room to wait. On entering, I happened to notice a book lying on the piano and casually picked it up. Yes, you've guessed it. The Full Blessing of Pentecost by Dr. Andrew Murray. But how did it get there? No one, except Eileen, knew anything of my interest in the subject. My parents didn't know where the book had come from. It's true that my father had always had a large collection of books, but if it was his, he certainly had never read it and didn't even know that he possessed it. Anyway, why wasn't it in the bookcase? And how did it get onto the piano? No one to this day has any idea how that book came to be there on the very day that I had thought it to be unobtainable. The answer must surely lie in the realm of the supernatural. With great anticipation, Eileen and I both read the book and then we both began to pray fervently that we too might be baptised with the Holy Spirit. But the rest of the story must wait till later in the series. So God used Laurie Dixon to speak to me. This wasn't only by his words, but also by his actions. No doubt, we're all familiar with the expression actions speak louder than words. Less well known is the Latin motto, factor non verba, which means deeds, not words. We've already seen how God speaks to us through Jesus, both by what he said and what he did. His actions, as much as his words, show us what God is like and how he wants us to behave. And this is how he often speaks to us today, through the words and actions of other people. A good example of God speaking to me through the actions of another Christian is our friend Jill Cooper, who used to help Eileen serve coffee on Sunday mornings at our local church. What she did was incredibly simple. But before I tell you what it was... I need to give you the background story. In February 2010, Eileen and I went to India for a month at the invitation of the Finnish Pentecostal churches who asked me to go and teach about the Holy Spirit where they had mission, missionaries working in Mumbai and Machili Patnam. Now, while I was the principal at Madison Hall Bible College, we had the privilege of training many overseas students, several of whom were from India. And when our former students heard about our trip, 
they were quick to ask if we would visit them too so that I could preach in the numerous churches they had planted since returning from Mattersy. We, of course, were delighted to agree, but I knew that the schedule they organised for me would be quite intense and, as I've already as I've always believed in observing a Sabbath principle, I ask that one day in seven should be a rest day. However, in practice, this didn't happen as the day they scheduled as the rest day was the day we had to travel from one place to the next. As a result, And because that year the temperature in India was higher than usual, I was suffering from dehydration and to the disappointment of all concerned, a few of the meetings scheduled had to be cancelled. Apart from this, we'd had a great time in India and after a few weeks back in England, I thought I had fully recovered. But towards the end of April, on a preaching trip to Essex, I started to experience similar symptoms to those I'd had in India. I couldn't understand this as the temperature in England was about half what it had been in India. Without going into unnecessary detail, the next two years proved to be extremely difficult. I continued to experience similar problems every time I preached. I began to wonder if the time had come for me to give up. Then, just at the right time, Eileen and I were in Exeter at a meeting for Assemblies of God ministers and their wives. The guest preacher was John Glass, the general superintendent of the Elim churches. He was preaching on Jeremiah 1 when he came to verses 11 to 12. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. John explained the play on words that we find in these verses. The Hebrew word for almond is very similar to the word for watch. The almond tree is among the first to blossom in spring. It's something you watch for as a sign that spring has come. Winter will surely be followed by spring because God watches over his word to see that it is fulfilled. Now in England, most of us don't see an almond tree too often. So John likened it to crocuses. In his garden, he said, They're the first flowers to bloom in spring. They're the sign or guarantee that the winter won't be forever. Then John broke away from his notes and said something like this. There are some of you here who are feeling that your ministry has come to an end. You've been experiencing a bleak winter. But the Lord wants you to know that it will not be forever. You will experience a new springtime. Eileen and I looked at each other. Was this for us? Surely it must be. But there were a lot of other people in that meeting. Could it be that John's prophetic word was for them and not for us? We drove home after the meeting, hoping rather than believing that this really was a word from the Lord for us. And then that evening, Jill Cooper arrived on our doorstep and said, I brought you a little present. To be honest, I had bought it for someone else, but then I felt the Lord tell me to give it to you instead. What was the present? A bowl of crocuses. And without a doubt, I have experienced a new time in my ministry, a new springtime. 
So the Lord does speak to us through other Christians, both by their words and by their actions. And as the story I've just told you clearly illustrates, he most certainly speaks to us through preachers. But that's the subject for next time. Till then, the Lord bless you.